You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast. I managed to do my research on how African philanthropic organizations respond to disasters and how they put their own systems in place to assist marginalized groups and vulnerable populations. When you think of philanthropy, you think giving money, but it also includes giving of your time. It also includes giving of your resources. We have a lot of that because of that ingrained spirit to help one another. The traditional givers and grant makers, the big philanthropists, Philanthropies are from the outside, and a lot of what is understood about Africa is very narrow in scope. Stay tuned as we bring you inspiring people who are unlocking Africa's economic potential. You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast with your host, Tessa Adamu. Welcome to the Unlocking Africa podcast where we find amazing people who are doing amazing things to unlock Africa's economic potential. Today we have another special guest. We have Dr. Keritilo Mugotzi from the Center on African Philanthropy and Social Investment, which works to bridge the gap in the study, research and practice of philanthropy and social investment in Africa. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Dr. Caritilo. How are you? I'm very well, and thank you so much for that warm welcome, Tessa. It's great to have you on the podcast. So before we start, I was hoping you could introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about Dr. Caritilo. Indeed. Uh, my name is Kirati Rumokhozi. I am an academic, a teacher. I actually call myself a key kindler because I use the power of education to inform and to plant seeds in various lives to help my students to achieve all that's possible with their lives. Uh, I'm currently teaching, as you mentioned, for the University of the Witwatersrand, Rand. And right now I'm at Chatham University in Pittsburgh in the U.S. So I've taken my teaching to a global scale, but I remain firmly rooted as an African child. I'm a mother and a wife as well to a, a teenager. She just turned 13. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. So wish me all the best with that. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's me in a nutshell. Brilliant, brilliant. Fantastic introduction. So you've given us insights into your professional and personal life. I know your work focuses on African philanthropy. So I was wondering if you could tell us about your mission and goals with regards to African philanthropy. Yeah, so it's actually a funny story. I got into the field a couple of years ago, but my inspiration was by our own systems. Um, If you've ever spent any time in Africa, you will know that uh, we do have our ways Uh, of doing things. I was just joking with you now about how we treat uh, strangers versus how strangers are treated in other contexts. We have our ways and our systems. And I felt that um, those were not infiltrating into the literature. And a lot of what is understood about Africa is very narrow in scope. I mean, some of the questions I get asked here, I'm, I'm, I'm in Pittsburgh right now, A person will ask me, um, okay, they met someone a couple of years ago and that person is in Nairobi. Have I met him? And I'm thinking, (laughs) like, do you understand the distance between um, Johannesburg and Nairobi? You need to catch a four-hour flight to get there. So we are a big continent. Uh, We we have a lot to offer as well. And I managed to uh, do my research on how Uh, African philanthropic organizations uh, respond to disasters and how they put their own systems in place um, to assist marginalized groups and and vulnerable populations. Because a lot of what you see on TV, um, a lot of what you understand in, in mass media is very limited. It doesn't even scratch the surface uh, in terms of how we do things in Africa and how we help each other. 
Interesting. So you mentioned that your inspiration was from our own systems and our ways and the lack of information that is actually out there with regards to African philanthropy. So what do you believe needs to happen to bridge that gap in terms of the study and practice of philanthropy in Africa? Yeah, so we we are working on it. The establishment of the center, I mean, the center is about three years old, uh, four actually, four years old. And it came into fruition because of of this gap um, in the practice of philanthropy and the study of it as well. Reason being... um, the field of philanthropy is a very Western concept. Even that word, it's a very complicated word. Um, we don't use that um, in our languages. We don't have it in our languages. But if you explain to any African, even if they've never been to school, what philanthropy actually means. So if you mean, okay, helping someone, sharing your resources, giving of your time, giving of your energy, giving of your resources. They'll be like, oh yeah, I do that. So am I a philanthropist then? So when you explain, you realize that it's part and parcel of our day-to-day lives. We don't even need to go to school to learn about helping or to learn about giving and sharing. So the center came about specifically to bridge that gap and to help people to, to understand African philanthropy, which is embedded in our nature, which is embedded in the way in which we do things around here. It's our system uh, per se, and we even have our own systems of giving uh, and helping. I don't know, Tessa, for um, you living in the diaspora and, and other Africans as well, you find that a lot of them also start to create your own systems, even in that place that you 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 are living in, right? Yes. You create like a giving circle. We know that you have to assist at home. Nobody needs to drill that into your head. So we create like little community groups where we share our money so that you can assist with things at home. Or you share your money to help um, each other with big decisions in life or big events in life, like your weddings or if you have an unfortunate event of a funeral and that kind of things. So we have our own coping mechanisms and you find that even spilling out of the continent because every African child um, gets grown into this context no matter which part of the the continent you grew up in, we have that embedded in us. So our uh, center focuses on trying to bring those systems into place, our own giving circles into place and our own coping mechanisms um, into place. So you've mentioned something quite interesting there, which is philanthropy is ingrained in African culture and also the recent studies and research that you're doing through the centre. So through this research, how would you say the global interest in philanthropy in Africa has evolved over the years? It's it's actually growing a lot of interest. This field is um, is growing. The center was the first of its kind. It still is the only center on the entire African continent that teaches African philanthropy. However, you find that year on year there are more people that are interested in studying this, um, getting to you know enroll and uh, trying to do some research in the field as well. So a lot of interest has grown but even western like outside of africa a lot of people are interested in african context because there's this huge gap as we've mentioned of studies that are from african countries uh by african people as well there's a huge gap of understanding this horizontal form of giving which is uh, embedded in our our life cycle so it's beneficial for any scholar really um, to tap into this um, growing field, uh, to tap into the African content contest because we don't um, have a lot of research in that area, although it is growing very significantly right now. Fantastic. So as you mentioned, the centre is the only centre that studies African philanthropy. So would you say that the lack of research and study done so far is a challenge for African philanthropies? 
it is a gap indeed um, uh, because we need more of it, right? So we would need more centers um, coming up, more studies um, getting published, but more practice as well um, getting known in outside of Africa. So it is a challenge, but also we find that African philanthropies um, because they have their ways, and it's so important to highlight that, they also face um, challenges in growing their work. So the traditional givers and grant makers, the big philanthropies are from the outside. So if they don't have an understanding of how things are on the ground, obviously there's a misalignment from the onset um, in what are the priorities that need funding, what are the priority social issues and social justice initiatives um, that would need the support. So trying to communicate that to a grant maker who's, you know, isolated, who's not in touch uh, with the things that are happening on the ground would obviously be very challenging. I must say, though, that there's growing uh, Indigenous African philanthropy. So we have big philanthropies that are coming up. I'm speaking of your Danjuma Foundations, your Dangote Foundations, your Mutsebe Foundations, uh, Strive Masiwa, Delta Philanthropies and the like. So we are getting a lot of that, which is um, going to be very helpful to, to help um, increase the number of African giving. Brilliant. So you mentioned in order for African philanthropies to grow their work requires cooperation with international bodies. So you touched on this, but what are some of the challenges faced by African philanthropies when cooperating with international initiatives? It's really the disconnect. Um, so if I just give you a practical example, it must have been 2019, there was a major cyclone that um, hit um, Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe. It, it swept its way through there, actually killed a lot of people in the process, destroyed infrastructure. So it was a crisis. It was a disaster. At the time that, um, you know, the early days after it happened, obviously philanthropy puts attention to that. So you have all sorts of funders coming to the ground, international and local community-based organizations coming there. So the disconnect comes in, you know, like what language are we going to use now to communicate with everybody? What process are we going to put in place? Because UN agencies are there, they have their own processes, um, Another, you know, Dutch or German organization is there as well. They also have their own processes. Um, you know, UK funders are there. They also have their own processes. So you have all these people uh, with different policies and ways of doing yes. things. Yeah, and we need to act uh, right now. We don't even speak the same language in Mozambique. They speak Portuguese, um, you know, so... We found that a lot of time is, is also lost in just trying to, to get a method um, going and every funder wants to do research first, you know, to do the needs assessment uh, before they can act. So at the time you're losing time, you're also losing people um, as well. So we find that that disconnect and not having uh, clear collaborations because they've never really worked, ever had to work together. In such a case, you would require the government or the local authorities to help orchestrate everybody. But in crisis, it becomes so much more difficult with all these bodies coming together. So that misalignment and disconnect sometimes comes into fruition and you see it at play, especially in crisis situations. I agree. I agree. So if we take a few steps back earlier on, you mentioned that philanthropy is ingrained in African culture, which I agree with 100%. But it's not something that we knowingly practice. It's just a way of life, a part of our culture. Why do you think this is not recognised and philanthropy is now associated with more Western organisations or bodies or people? Yeah, so that's actually why I hear academics like myself and um, the, the Center for African Philanthropy and Social Investment and all the researchers that are there in the center and the academics that are there in the center. 
because uh, it is a fact that you don't, even a child knows, right, that if something is happening next door, there's a funeral next door, you need to, you know, go and assist, not on the day of the funeral, you need to go a couple of days before, help with the cooking, help with, um, you know, the comforting the other people that have lost. We know that. Yes. And it's become difficult because we inherited, I mean, if you know the history of Africa, we inherited all our legal systems and processes from the colonial power. So the British colonies follow the, the British laws. The French colonies follow the French uh, laws, et cetera, et cetera. So you find that in simple things, you know, like um, getting leave, if you needed to ask for leave at work, um, they recognize, this actually happened to me, they recognize your biological parents or so your direct parents and your own siblings. That's the only time you can be approved for, for leave. So if your mother's sister or your uh, father's brother passes away, they don't recognize that. But to us, that is your mother. Your mother's sister yes. is your mother. Yes. Your father's brother is your father. So it's quite a big deal. And you, you'll be required to do a very big role in that funeral. So it's not something... Um, they need to take it as seriously as they would have if it was your, your own father. So we find this very uncomfortable situations that uh, we come up in because you don't understand the African culture, that a, a person is very disturbed if their mother's sister passes away. And even if your neighbor passes away, you may have to uh, go and assist there as well. So... We are documenting, we are also preparing a lot of research to understand um, giving systems, right? I mentioned a, a giving circle uh, earlier. We do things, we do lots of interesting things that are praiseworthy, actually, and I'm very proud of. So like your merry-go-rounds, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, uh, Tessa. No, no. Yeah, this is like where people can come together. So I can like, me and my friends, five of us, we are all working. We decide, okay, this month we are all, so we know we contribute, you know, just for argument's sake, a thousand rand every month right? But this month, we're all going to give our thousands of rands to Tessa. Yes. Next month, we give it to the next person. Next month, we give it to the other person. How it helps is that it means at some point or twice during the year, depending on how many people are in that um, system, you will have a lump sum of money to pay for things that require a lump sum of money, you know, like I don't know, put a deposit on a car or something like that. So that's how we we, we help ourselves. Uh, and this is not a formal banking system. There's a lot of trust that's involved, you know, because <laughs> if I don't pay my thousand rand, I don't get prosecuted, but you know you have to. So we have a trust-based and a form of solidarity uh, knowing that it's going to be my turn one day. So I need to do unto others as I would like them to, to do unto me when it's my turn. So things like that, uh, to bring that into the limelight, to bring these kind of systems and ways of coping that we have for ourselves into the limelight. Brilliant. I guess most African countries, we have a similar system, but obviously it goes by yeah. different names, but yeah. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> so, what do you call it? <laughs> so there's a range, it depends on which part of Nigeria you're in. Even okay. some Caribbean friends, they have it as well within yeah, their yeah. community. And I know it's something that is well secure, well guarded. And if anyone messes about and misses payment, it's quite frowned upon. <laughs> Exactly. And then who taught us this? You say someone from the Caribbean, who, who taught us that? Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. Exactly. And yet we all behave that way. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. It <laughs> so you've shared some philanthropic behavior in different African contexts and histories and how they differ from philanthropic activities in other parts of the world. So would you say... 
there are key differences in the type of philanthropic activities being pursued in Africa compared to outside of Africa? Um, Yes, they are. And a lot of those differences are actually influenced by the history, right? So remember, most of the major philanthropies were formed in the industrial time. So if you think of like Andrew Carnegie, who made his fortune around the 1800s, so he founded Carnegie Corporation, I don't know, when was it, early 1900s or something like that. If you think of Ford, um, also made his fortune um, through the Ford Corporation and all of that. So during those industrial times, a lot of these uh, philanthropies came into being. But now um, the reason for giving was really the tax incentive. So you wouldn't pay as much tax if you give some of it back. Um, And then you find that some that still exist today, they still receive those benefits of of the tax breaks, et cetera. In Africa, however, because we are so, you know, our legal processes are so spaghetti-like and diverse and, and complex and also influenced by our history, having been colonized by various different forces, you'll find that there are tax benefits for some and no tax benefits for others or unclear uh, policy development for the nonprofit sector. So it's not as clear as you will receive a certain percentage of of a tax break. So already that changes um, how we look at things because we are registered differently. Uh, We receive different benefits depending on the philanthropy that you do. But also because we have this indigenous and horizontal type of giving is is what it's called, you'll find that um, we have a lot of giving of time as well. When you think of philanthropy, you think giving money, isn't it? That how much money was given to that, but it also includes giving of your time. It also includes giving of your resources. So we have a lot of that because of that ingrained spirit to help one another. Uh, We do give a lot of our time. I can tell you when there's a funeral back in our village, which is very far from Johannesburg, I get sad because I know I have to go, right? I know I need to make that journey, uh, whether I like it or not, because People will, they're not going to mark a register, but they will remember that she didn't come for that thing, you know, or she she didn't participate, she didn't help with that. So we have our own registration processes because it means when I'm now grieving, people will remember, oh, yes, she did come and help me. And yes. therefore they come and help you as well, right? So you're sort of investing um, in in yourself as well. So our, yeah, our giving practices are are, are different. Um, Also, you can record the amount of time and resources. And resources, I'm not even speaking about just money. People can give you a goat, can contribute a goat. That saves you a lot of money from going to buy meat for, for your function or give you some chickens that also saves you money for you buying it yourself. So it's not large scale as me giving you a million dollars as a philanthropy would, but me saving you a lot of time, saving you a lot of your own money, trying to get that thing as well. It counts as well. So our systems and our giving ways uh, would definitely be much, much different from, from the Western organizations. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, from a personal point of view, I had a conversation with a friend recently regarding Africans living in the diaspora. And whenever there's, say, a funeral or a wedding back home, there is an, I wouldn't say expectation, but you know that you have to send something back home. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) You have to. Yes. No one expects you really to jump on a flight and go over. On some occasions they do, but if not, there is a yeah, there is an expectation to send something back home. And they're not gonna ask you, right? You just know that you have to. They're yeah. not gonna be like, Oh, aren't you sending? They just know that the fact that they've informed you that's enough. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, interesting (laughs) conversation. As we've kind of discussed before, it is ingrained in our culture. Exactly. Nobody taught you that. No, no. And it's even more amazing. I mean, I think you mentioned you've been there for a very long time, right? So you yes. practically grew up there. So that's even more outstanding because you haven't even lived in this context, but you know. Yes, you know. Right? <laughs> Nobody has to tell you, you just exactly. know. <laughs> you can never take Africa out of the heart, I suppose. No, it's it's exactly. it's in your blood, it's in your veins. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you touch on something quite important there, which is the historical element of philanthropic activity in Africa, which has created a specific narrative. So what would you say needs to be done to rewrite that narrative of African philanthropy and I guess challenge any existing misconceptions? So I think the step that we've taken on research is definitely good so that there's, you know, scholarly research that you can provide. I think now if you Google African philanthropy, quite a lot will come up as would have come up maybe 10 years ago. So we are definitely making strides there, but it doesn't stop there. Africans are known for storytelling you'll find that education and information is shared through storytelling. And I think that's such a beautiful thing because the African people become so wise without even having had gone to school, you know what I mean? So you need to be able to tell these stories. We need to be able to show them in our visual literature so the films that are coming from africa bring that out you know how we we do weddings around here these giving circles that we do it will reach a much bigger population through that through our songs we are very good with the music as well um also throw it in there somehow about how you've been assisted by other people to be who you are today, you know, and um, your own giving circles. Throw it in our poetry and our literature. Then it becomes a way of being. For me, I've learned a lot through literature. I, I think school can teach you a lot, but also literature can teach you a lot. I had never been to Senegal until 2022. I visited Senegal, but I used to read the books of Mariam Aba. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Yes. Yes, she was a Senegalese author. But through her literature, I had this imagination of the Senegalese culture and what to expect there. So I was very excited to go there and to start to identify some of the things I read about so many years ago. So it's up to everyone. It's not even just the center's responsibility alone. If you are an artist kind of person, bring your Africanness in that. If you're a chef, right, if you cook, we have beautiful um, dishes. I've been searching the streets of Pittsburgh <laughs> for African food because it's only been a few weeks and already I'm missing home and things that I like to eat back home. So I've been looking for it, right? And I've learned that in all these cities, there's an African corner somewhere where you can find some of the things that we are familiar with. So if you're a cook, you know, bring it in your work. Being a chef, bring your Africanness. If you're a teacher like I am, bring it out in your teaching methods. If you are a painter, bring it out. So we we can all contribute to change that misconception and narrative. Beautiful. So you touched on something important, which is that Africans are known for storytelling and history, culture is usually passed orally. So what role do you see technology innovation playing within the field of philanthropy in Africa? So technology has been an enabler and actually it has created another focus area that we can look into. And what I mean by that is thanks to technology, now you can easily send money home. Is that right? Yes. So if there's some crisis, you just go to Western Union and and it, it gets sorted within a day. So it has made our giving more efficient We are also able to calculate remittances because you can track 
and count um, how much inflows have, have come into a certain area, how much outflows have gone out, so we can track giving behavior in monetary terms. So in other words, technology has helped us to be able to measure some of the things that philanthropy focuses on, to measure the amount of money, to measure the amount of, of time, because you have this mechanism that can can do so. I, I find it uh, very interesting and also a very big opportunity as well, because now, unlike in the past, we can actually track and measure some things, right? And I just want to give you a very simple example. Um, my grandmother growing up, she finished in standard five, which is, I think, grade four, grade five, they're about just when she could read and write and then they, they took her out of school. However, this woman took one look at me when I was pregnant with my, my daughter I wasn't, I wasn't far along. I don't even know how many weeks I was. And she told my mother that you, she's pregnant. And then my mom came to ask me. And then I was like, oh, okay. Then I tested. And guess what? Wow. I was. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, how did this woman know? Like, we didn't even spend so much time together. She just took one good look at me and came up with that accurate scientific conclusion right? She has never touched a lab coat or any test tubes or anything like that. She doesn't have a forecasting tool and yet she can accurately, um, you know, predict and forecast such things. So now we do have tools. We do have thermostats to measure temperature. We even have early warning systems to tell you that a flood is about to hit. Uh, you have these accurate tests that can tell you how far along you are. So we are in a better time now because we have these tools that should make life easier for us. So you've detailed how technology has enabled us to measure impacts and money, manage time. With that in mind, how would you say philanthropy in Africa directly contributes to economic development? It directly contributes to, to economic development because without it, we may have much bigger poverty levels. And this is poverty in the true sense. The measurement of poverty now is how many dollars per day you, you live on and, and all of that stuff. But if you go to um, a village or if I also look back at how I grew up, maybe somebody would have considered that you know, less fortunate or whatever, but we we were good. We were happy, right? You never went to bed hungry. You know, you had parents and even not only just your mother and your father, you had your aunts, your uncles, people who could support you, a network of support um, for, for various life issues. So we were very rich, actually. Um, we were able to live fully and enjoy life in the way that it's, it's supposed to be enjoyed. And I think if you go to some of these villages, they like taking pictures of African people in like dire poverty. But if you yes. go into their home and maybe spend some time and understand how they live, do they echo what you see in the picture? So it almost needs to question what does uh, living well mean what is poverty truly because i think someone who's sick of stress and dying of anxiety and high blood pressure and barely having a moment to speak to your child i think that is extreme poverty whereas we got to spend a lot of time with our grandparents we learned stories from them about how they grew up and, and how they view life and those stay with you for the rest of your life. So I just think we need to probably put that into perspective and understand what poverty means contextually. I agree. So you've detailed a link between philanthropy and economic development. A key driver of economic development is diversity and inclusion. How do you believe philanthropy in Africa contributes to promoting diversity and inclusion of marginalized people? 
Africa is a very big continent, first of all, 54 states, um, 55 if you include the Sahara region in Morocco. Yes. We have over 3,000 languages, 2,000 yeah. tribes, even in the same country. You may find, I know like Nigeria, for example, has many languages. South Africa has 12. Zimbabwe has uh, three. But every country has more than one or two or even yes. five in, in some cases. So we're very diverse in our nature. What that means is that it's also different cultures because of these 2,000 tribes, uh, different views on things, different ways of doing things as well. So I think in our identity and our existence, we are diverse already. Yes. And we have a lot to contribute to the world in that diversity. Brilliant, brilliant. So I guess with that in mind, what would you say are some of the key areas that need further attention and development to enable African philanthropy to thrive in the future? I think we are making ground in terms of closing that research gap. But I think what we would definitely want to see more of is Indigenous systems and Indigenous knowledge. I gave you the example of my grandmother. But if you speak to, especially the elderly, you'll actually realise they know a lot um, which they didn't learn from school. So they can tell you, like, you know what, we're actually going to have heavy rains this year, right? Yeah. They can be like, ah, okay, the sun is over there. It must be 3 o'clock, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it is 3 o'clock. And then if you take the roots of that tree, so if you have, like, a, a headache, you take the roots of that tree, it's going to sort out your, your headache, if you go through childbirth, oh, my grandmother came with all sorts of concoctions <laughs> and things that you need to take that will help you. And none of them are pharmacy prescribed. So they know a lot. So I think we need to tap into that, that indigenous knowledge, especially before we lose everybody. My grandmother has passed away, but there are still some who are there. We want to take as much as we can before we lose that generation. I agree. So you detail the need for more indigenous knowledge in terms of how to enable African philanthropy to thrive in the future. So with that in mind, where do you see African philanthropy in, say, five years' time? Uh, five years' time is the, the near future. So by 2028 or so. I actually see many more scholars coming up in the field. It's promising because of the amount of uh, PhDs that are studying the field. Also, there's the master's degree that was recently launched at the Center for African Philanthropy uh, and the postgraduate diploma. So those people would have finished uh, in five years' time. So they are all looking at some of these topics that we've uh, talked about that they are lacking in research. Some of them are looking at community foundations. Some of them are starting to look at these indigenous uh, knowledge systems. Some of them are looking at um, African grant making, etc. So all of that will have come into fruition in five years' time. And hopefully we have even more people that are studying this and more people that are applying and able to talk about it in their areas of practice. Because African philanthropy, you don't even need to specialize in African philanthropy. You can apply it in any field. Um, even with your podcast right now, you yes. can apply African philanthropy in there. In health, you can apply it in there. In education, you can apply it. It's applicable everywhere. I agree. So looking closer to home, where do you see yourself and the African Centre for Philanthropy in five years' time? Well, I've actually um, grown much faster than my, my own imagination. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm here in the US now. I never imagined that could happen. But I'm here because of, of this. And I'm also here to continue spreading this message of African philanthropy and social entrepreneurship, etc. So I hope that I'm definitely going to go back home. 
Yes. And when I do, I just hope that maybe I can also create my own center or continue pushing this agenda forward. Quote of the week. As people, we often have quotes, mantras, African proverbs or affirmations that keep us going when times are challenging or when times are good. Do you have one that you can share with us today? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> uh, everybody knows Ubuntu, right? And Wood. Yes. But it's such a simple, powerful saying which we should apply in every aspect of our lives. It says Ubuntu, 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 which means I am because you are. Uh, there was a singer called Brenda Fassi. She she passed away, but she sang a song when she was at the heat of her career. And she was saying, thank you to my Africa. I wouldn't be where I am without you. So she remembered this. And I think let's not forget that once you make it, once you are this big shot, don't forget the people that made you who you are and know that you are made by people not yourself beautiful you actually made me feel like i was back home in that moment Yay. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy i could do that <laughs> brilliant that was lovely so as we're coming to the end of today's conversation i know you need to rush off and deliver one of your lectures do you have any yeah. closing remarks final course to action for people who are interested in african philanthropy and the work that you're doing Absolutely. Africa is a massive continent. We all have a role to play. If you're listening to this and you are from any part of Africa, you have a role to play as well. And like I said, it doesn't matter what field you're in, what your discipline is. You can apply this Bundu, Bundu into your practice. You can apply African systems, African philanthropy into your practice. So let's do that. I hope that we can become like the Japanese, right? So Japanese people, no matter where they go, they don't lose. Yeah, so they come into the U.S., they'll teach, they'll do whatever, but they are identifiable through their names. They are identifiable through their language. They even bring their customs and systems into, into business. If you do business with someone from Japanese, they'll come and give you one of their, their things yes. that they bring from, from Japan, right? So I want us to be like that as well as, as Africans, to be identifiable through our names, to be identifiable through our language, to be identifiable through our customs and our systems. Let's not blend in but rather take pride in standing out and share that standing out back to the world as people that have something to offer as well. I agree 100%. I've thoroughly enjoyed today's conversation. It's been very different to a lot of the conversations I've had in the past. It's something that's definitely well needed. And I've gained some valuable insights into the growing field of African philanthropy. So thank you, Dr. Kerry T. Lowe. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you so much, uh, Tessa. It's been my pleasure. Thank you to everyone who has listened and stayed tuned to the podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, share or tell a friend about it. You can also rate, review us in Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast. Thank you and see you next week for the Unlocking Africa podcast.